Lab number three is entitled Diode Curve Tracer and Digital Thermometer. In ECE302, we've been discussing the VI characteristics of diodes. If you plot the voltage from anode to cathode of a diode versus the current through it from anode to cathode, you get an exponential curve. Because there is a slight slope to this curve, you can talk about the turn-on voltage at a particular value of current. For example, if you have a silicon diode, at around 1 milliamp, the drop is roughly 0.6 volts. If you had a red LED, around 1.6 volts, a green LED, around 1.8, and a blue, around 2.8. Now this will vary depending on the specific diode and doping characteristics, but these are just ballpark numbers. For a resistor, we have a relationship between voltage and current. Here we have a relationship between the voltage across the diode and the current through it in terms of three constants, I sub s, eta, and V sub t. You can also solve this equation for V sub d in terms of I sub t. So either equation we can use to characterize the, the diode. This is a nonlinear equation, as we've shown in class, that doesn't have a closed form solution. The three constants here, eta, I sub s, and V sub t, V sub t is actually a known value if you have a specific temperature. We said in class it's around 26 millivolts at room temperature. The term I sub s in this equation is usually on the order of picoamperes. Now the meters we have in lab only go down to the microamp range. So this is many orders of magnitude away from something that we can measure. How are we going to determine these constants of I sub s and eta? Because I need those to be able to have this equation so I can evaluate it. Well, there's two unknowns, so I would need two data points to solve for it. But let's take two data points at a part on the curve where we could actually measure them. For instance, suppose that we forward bias the diode and we measure the voltage and the current at, say, this point, call it I sub B and V sub B, and then do the same thing at another point, say, call it I sub A and V sub A. We'd like these points to be not real close to each other because we're really going to curve fit the entire curve to pass through these two points. And the farther they are away, the more accurate that fit will be. If we take a look at the equation where we solve for the voltage across the diode in terms of the current through it, we have this relationship. If the current I sub A is on the order of milliamps, well then this ratio is much greater than one. We call that being strongly forward biased. You can pretty much neglect that term and we just have eta v sub t times the natural log of i sub a over i sub s. Same is true for the second data point with the current i sub b. I could throw that term away if we're talking about milliamps. Again, compared to picoamps. If you subtract these two voltages, we have a common eta v sub t, and we've got the, the difference of two natural logs. You recall from algebra that the difference of two logs is also the log of their ratio. So if I take the first term and divide it by the second, the term I sub s drops out. What I've got now is the equation where I know the voltages, V sub b and V sub a. I know V sub t if I know the temperature of the diode. And I know the currents I sub b and I sub a. So I can then solve for eta. Once I know eta, I can then go back to the Shockley equation for maybe the first or the second data point and then evaluate the value of I sub s, because I know this, I know this, and now I know the value of eta, and it can be sub t at a specific temperature. So now I could extract the value of I sub s by just dividing by this term. Suppose we design a curve tracer where we could collect the data points that we need for in the Shockley equation. Our oscilloscope in lab will plot voltage versus time, but you can actually disable the time axis and plot voltage versus voltage. In our case, we want to plot the current of the diode versus the voltage across it, so we need to convert our, di our diode current into a voltage. One circuit that's able to do this is the inverting amplifier that we talked about in last lab. Well, you put a diode here in place of the resistor R1, then the voltage of the voltage source with zero volts across here, because we have feedback, becomes the diode voltage. And then the, the diode current then is forced to flow into the resistor R2. And so the rise in voltage here 
would be a drop of minus I sub D times R2 plus V out. So we would have V out in terms of I sub D in R2. So now I've converted the current in the diode to a voltage. And then my input voltage is the diode voltage. Suppose we used a 1000 ohm resistor. Then for one volt out, we would have corresponding one milliamp of current. Problem is that there's a minus sign here. And so we'd be plotting really the negative of what we, what we want. This would put us, instead of in the first quadrant, it would put us in the fourth quadrant. Is there some way to fix that up so we could you know, plot the curves as we had them on page one? Well, we have, again, the inverting amplifier allows us to change signs, so let's use it to change the sign of our result. So I'll put a gain of one circuit in, and you can use any resistors here. I uh, could use also 1Ks again, or maybe 10Ks or 12Ks, but I picked two other values here just to illustrate the fact that you don't have to use the same value for the feedback resistor. It's really the ratio that counts. But now what I have out here is a I sub D times 1K. So for every milliamp of current I have in a diode, I wind up having a volt here in, in the output. Now having the voltage source across the diode can be a little tricky because a few millivolt change in the input causes a lot of current changing in the diode. Maybe we should throw a resistor in between and then just measure this node voltage because it'll correspond to the voltage of the diode because there's zero volts here. So we can vary this voltage with a sine wave say input and then a voltage will show up here and we just put that on the x-axis and then we'll put this on the y-axis of the scope and just change the scale from volts per division to milliamps per division. Now one of the problems of building op amp circuits with multiple op amps is that sometimes the voltages that we, we look at on the oscilloscope have all kinds of high frequency noise on top of them. And a lot of that's coming from the fact that we've got very long wires relative to our circuit wires, maybe about three feet, from the DC power supplies. And our, our op amps look like very nonlinear loads to the power supply lines. And, and the inductance of the wire with this nonlinear load can cause the system to go uh, chaotic and just be oscillating at no real predictable frequency. Well, the theory for that's pretty complicated, and we'll talk a little bit about oscillators later in this course. But there's a very simple solution that most people use in building electronic circuits, and that is to add a capacitor right, very close to the power pins of the chip. And what this is doing is holding this voltage, not letting it change if it were trying to oscillate. And the same is true for this line over here. The largest values of capacitors we can put here with a dielectric that's very good at high frequencies is around 0.1 or so microfarads. So we'll use these we call them bypass capacitors because they're essentially taking that high frequency signal and bypassing it to ground. Electrolytic capacitors wouldn't work well right here. They're not ideal effects when you get up into the hundreds of kilohertz and megahertz range are actually quite different than what you'd expect them to be. And we'll talk about that in other courses in modeling you know, high frequency effects of components. Now capacitors are in, usually in two values either microfarads or picofarads, and if it's in picofarads, many times it's with a code on the on the body of the capacitor. If you have a really old capacitor, it might actually have dots painted using uh, the colors of the color code. Here, this particular capacitor is stamped with 204K, and the way to interpret that is that that's 20 times 10 to the fourth. And like I said, that usually they're, well, capacitors are uh, listed in picofarads or microfarads, but when they're stamped like this, it's picofarads. That corresponds to 200,000 picofarads. The K is not 10 to the 3, but actually a tolerance of 10%. So this is equivalent to a 0.2 microfarad capacitor, uh, plus or minus 